Uh, I'm excited to, to have a conversation with someone I could now call my friend, John Yeager. Uh, John and I met a few years ago up at Middlebury College. Um, John and I both had a relationship with the athletic director, uh, Aaron Quinn, and I had the great privilege of uh, meeting John because he was presenting to a, a group of coaches, his philosophy on coaching, um, his uh, recommendations on how best to work with athletes and um, all of this and a whole lot more is in John's uh, new book called The Coaching Zone that I was truly honored to, to write a blurb for on the back, on the back cover. Something in my, in my blurb I wrote is probably the most complete book on, on coaching, on how to uh, that I've ever come across. So um, John and I uh, have a shared passion for helping athletes and helping coaches. We talk behind the scenes fairly frequently about all kinds of things, um, hoping to do some more work together. And so uh, John, thanks for joining us today and um, it's good to see your face again. It's great, it's great to see you, Mitch. And, and it's a privilege for me to have had the opportunity to meet you up in Middlebury because you were able to kind of, uh, kind of stimulate some different thinking in my own head about a variety of different things regarding sports psychology and how we best deal with coaches. Oh, that's, no, that's nice. I know we're, we're going to be able to help each other. You know, going back to that talk, the one thing, and it's related to the book, of course, John, because the one thing that stood out to me then that the coaches seem to have the most questions for you about had to do with your philosophy, your strategy, your protocol on communication. You have kind of a system of how you want coaches to think about communicating with athletes um, or things to be mindful of that I remember them sort of taking notes and asking you questions about these approaches. Could you describe, because I know this is in the book too, can you describe for us um, a little bit about your, your work in, around communication for coaches? Well, I think that, that, that athletes need to be listened to, taken seriously, feel genuinely needed, and have a meaningful purpose in what they do. And I think coaches who, have, who are lifelong learners and have that growth mindset have that capacity to see where the athlete is and be able to effectively communicate with, with them. I think in, 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 I could think, think of three different areas, and one is the idea of building vulnerability trust you know, uh, with the athlete and with the teams. And vulnerability trust is a term that's taken from Patrick Lencioni's work of working with teams. But it's, it's really about getting coaches to be honest with themselves and to be able to, if they make a mistake, that they, they kind of fess up in their own ways to it to make sure that the athlete is served correctly. You know, and I think that's really, really important so that it that it, that that allows for the athlete when they fail, okay, to to not be judged, you know, as if it's part of their identity or anything else like that, because as in sports, we fail all the time. And coaches make mistakes too. And I think I've I've seen in my interviews of coaches and really successful coaches that are that are able to develop that vulnerability trust. I think that's very important. The second area is, is, is mattering, that the athlete actually matters to other athletes on the team and they matter to the coach. And that's shown in a variety of different ways. One way is the development of uh, you know, coaches who have micro connections with the athlete. It's, it's, it's having those check-ins. You know, I, I think of a former lacrosse coach in Winchester, Massachusetts, John Pirani. John coached for around 45 years there. His last year, he had retired as special education coordinator, and he was just coaching. And so basically, he would drive up in his pickup at the end of the school day and wait right outside the locker room for the athletes to show up. And he would say, hey, how was your day? How was it going? And at the end of practice, when they came out of the locker room after showering, he was there for them again. And he says, you know, he wishes he could have done this for the 45 years beforehand, but, you know, duty called in the other aspects of life yeah. and, you know, kind of a... Uh... Yeah, I have a good example, John, of something similar with a coach in my neck of the woods who also coached maybe not as long as your friend, but for a long time. 
And in his last year before he retired, he was a Hall of Fame coach. His players were complaining that on Saturdays, because they also practiced on Saturdays, mm -hmm. they wanted music at the practice. They didn't want it to be so much like a normal practice in the way Monday through Friday was. And this guy who coached one way for so much of his career kind of realized that kids were changing, you know, that he had to listen to them, even though he had a system that clearly worked. And he was willing to do it. He was willing to bend and show them that it wasn't his way or the highway and that they could bring music and that if they brought it, you know, if they brought the heat to practice and they gave it all, the music was going to stick around and they found a way to make it work. And it, you know, and it contributed to part of their success in that season. So that's a, a good example too of matter. It, it, yeah, it, it's so powerful, you know, to really listen to what the, um, you know, the, 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 the athletes need you know, and because the coach is not the main actor. Right. It's the athletes, you know, right. in, in the narrative, you know, and, and, and that brings it to, to also, you know, having coaches be able to express empathy to athletes. You know, uh, I've had an opportunity at age 67. Now I'm, I'm working again with the Culver lacrosses. I'm working with their goalies. And I'm old enough to be the grandfather. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and when I first started coaching, I was four years, five years older than the seniors on the team. So it's, it's trying to find out where they are. And it brings into some interesting uh, aspects of a concept called the hot, cold empathy gap. And it's just that, you know, that the, you know, I've been there, I've done that. Okay. They are there doing that right now. What's it like to live in the skin of a 16 to 17 year old athlete or a college athlete or a youth athlete mm -hmm. it's much younger and to really to understand where they're coming from because they're in the hot moment right now and that you know, goes to this notion with COVID you know for many coaches you know missing a season or having a truncated season last year well, was well I've got this I've got other seasons coming up but for some of those athletes they don't have that eligibility to be there if they were right. seen and right. to really understand what is it like when you, as an adolescent or a young adult, when you can't do what you really want to do and love to do and to be out there. And I think that's where coaches can understand that better and express empathy and express co cognitive empathy where we're basically, they're really, you know, trying to live in the skin and actually feeling the emotional empathy. And I yeah. think, just as important, if not more, is showing empath empathic concern. And this is all based on the work that, that Daniel Goleman's done on his work, The Focus Leader. But showing empathic concern is basically saying, what do you need from me? I am here for you. Yeah. I think it resonates so powerfully, Mitch. Yeah, you know, I sometimes say for better or for worse, we're seeing in the professional ranks, you know, players and athletes, Olympians included, we're showing that they need they need people to understand to get them. They need people to their coaches and others to see that despite their great success, despite their million dollar contracts or their or their gold medals, um, they they need as much empathy, if not more, right? Than than everybody else. In other words, I I just think even now more than ever, and you could tell me, John, in your experience, does it feel like now more than ever coaches need to be tuned in? To that empathy to the empathy dial in the right way because kids and young people seem to have the weight of the world um on their on their shoulders if not for you know a hundred reasons including you know social media and um the professionalization of youth sports i mean i guess that's my question do you see now more than ever why the work you're doing with these coaches matters matters even more I, yeah i totally agree yeah definitely more than ever ever before you know, and, and that, you know, that, and that, that behooves the coach to be self-reflective of what their purpose is. Yeah. Because if you come in as a command control, it was my way, the highway, you know, and no music on Saturdays, you know, then, then, you know, things need to, you know, how can I, as a coach, see this and reflect and saying, you know, then how can I, what do I want from my athletes? But what do I want for my athletes? Yeah. And how can I, I how can I you know, make that happen? So I think coaches who continually revisit their purpose 
their own narrative, their own stories that brought them to where they are, they have a greater opportunity to live in a growth mindset to be able to address that, you know, without, without friction, you know, with their athletes. And I think that's, that's incredibly important. What, what, if anything's been the biggest barrier you think to coaches kind of taking on the work that you do and, you know, you're like a consultant, you're like a coach of coaches, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's how you, you know, position yourself. H has there been any particular barriers, John, that you found has made it hard for you to kind of like get coaches to buy in or get coaches to, to kind of listen, you know, more than maybe just, uh, you know, with one from one phone call from you or one consultation? I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what's it really like out there to try to get this message across. I think it's time. I think today with athletic directors and coaches, uh, the, the, the perceived or actual lack of time to be able to reflect and to do this. I've found this, I had a grant from a local in, in uh, Northwest Indiana uh, from a local community foundation to go into all the, uh, you know, uh, all the high schools in the county and, uh, and to do this program, the, the Coaching Zone Masterclass. You know, coaches get the books, doesn't cost them a cent. The ADs would love that and stuff like that. Now, now well, a couple of things that are also happening, they're also at that time doing some other book studies with another book that was out there by, by, by another coach there. But in some cases, when I, a couple of the schools that I got into and we had a, you know, finite amount of sessions that we're going to have, but the attendance at those sessions kind of dropped off based on not coaches not having the time, you know, but when they were in there, they were fully invested. Well, I, I, I mean, it. fully invested. I had one group that I worked with where we had 11 coaches and, and we had them for an hour for this session and it just flew. And they were working in triads with each other and in flying like that and stuff like that, set them up. And then the next meeting we had four. Well, you know, uh, you know, it was, you know, summer workouts or summer vacation or, you know, or other stuff came in there. And, and that's totally understandable. One of the things I'm doing right now, um, I'm working with uh, an independent school where we've got, you know, five 90 minute sessions where coaches have signed up and they have, they have basically uh, given, you know, are, are, are going to use that time. That's an independent school. It's an independent boarding school. And so they, they have more touches with their athletes. Okay, connection times. That's, yeah. a, that's a better way to say that. And they have more um, as opposed to some, you know, many public schools. Okay, yeah. youth programs where you don't have those, you don't have the, the, the time to be with them. And so they've dedicated the time to do this. And so I think that's, you know, that's a big area because coaches, coaches want to develop their human capital, which are the knowledge and skills of the things that they do. Right. And, and, and to, to understand the social emotional aspects of their athletes and their teams and themselves, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, that's the area that I really kind of harp on to getting them to listen to their own voices. I think that's really important. Yeah, no, I, I think we've had a similar experience where time and and, um, you know, when a coach does say, I'm going to carve out even 25 minutes at the end of a practice or before a practice um, to talk to me or, um, I, you know, I consider that like, you know, um, you know, it's like golden is just gold. It's, it's time that's worth gold to them. So right. I, it gives me a real sense of how seriously they take, they take the work um, that, that we do. One of my last questions has to do with sports psychology. Uh, I know you're not a sports psychologist, but you've been around, you've, you know, you've got a master's in applied positive psychology, you know, you've got your doctorate in education, you, you know your way around. Is there any for you, I don't know if, if there's any way for you when you rec make any recommendations to coaches about when they should send an athlete to go talk to somebody privately, is that something you get involved with at all or you come across where Coaches aren't sure what to do. They're telling you about these players. They're not sure what to do. Um, in other words, coaches can only do so much. That's right. This is one of the exactly. things, right? Exactly. They can't yes. be all things to all people. Um, 
And there's Lord knows there's a lot of pressure on coaches to, to do that. Do you, I guess I'm just curious how you interface, if you do interface with sports psychologists, you know, in the work that you do or when you might make a recommendation for sports psych. Any thoughts? I on do. That? Yes, I, I do. I mean, some coaches uh, uh, sometimes perceive them to be, uh, I'll call it Mick mindfulness, okay, where they kind of like a, like a fast food sports psychology because they went to a conference or they read something. But truly, issues go way beyond, uh, you know, just, you know, j j just some, some, some basic things that are happening on and off the field. But I think when coaches start getting red flags, from athletes regarding a, a number of different areas, you know, um, you know whether it's performance-based, enjoyment-based, satisfaction-based. That if they they had they you know, and I've talked with coaches before about connecting them with with uh, mental skills consultants and sports psychologists, you know, to to do that, and I, I you know to 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 refer. The, the, the athlete to them so that they can get a better sense of, of, of where they are. Because whether or not the, the issue begins, whether it's, it's specifically sports related or are there other issues that are happening outside, okay, familial, social, and stuff like that, that where sports psychologists can be very, very, very helpful, you know, with that. And, 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 and to really look at, at at some of the skills that that the the athlete really you know needs to work on it and it, it brings me to this you know this notion of you know I think sports psychologists are really good at helping athletes develop psychological capital it's where and that's that's based on kind of the acronym by Fred Luthens and his colleagues from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln called Hero H is for hope E is for efficacy or confidence. And you talk a lot about the notion of confidence, but having courage when you don't or aren't confident to be having courage over confidence, uh, optimism and, uh, and, uh, and resilience. And I think when, when uh, a sports psychologist are, are, you know, many of them are very, very talented as you are with helping athletes to, to, to identify and distinguish what areas that might not be might right. not be working for them, and then they can bring that forward to increase their their performance, their enjoyment, and their satisfaction. Right, right. And you bring up, you know, to me, the thing you hit on that really resonated with me. If the coaches really can see the kid isn't enjoying themselves, and I know some of these big time sports, you know, these kids are going for big goals and they've got big dreams. But the truth is you should really love to go out and play. You should love to compete. You should love the, the thrill of it all, you know, the thrill of the competition. Some of these kids are spending more time with their coaches, right, than they are with their families. And exactly. they're certainly talking more. And so, um, um, you know, one of the things I know you know we love to do is to connect with these coaches to get them to see they don't have to be at all, you know, they don't have to do it all. That's correct. That there are yes. other people who yes. can support them could support their players and if everybody's working in tandem and on the same page you know nobody loses and everybody kind of wins so to speak so, exactly exactly um no this is this is great john is there anything else that you're working on or anything else that's kind of uh cooking for you or you're hoping to get your hands on that you want to mention uh, before we sign off well we're trying to look at uh I, i'm working with and developing being several different facilitators throughout the the uh, uh, country to to deliver the coaching zone masterclass and trying to get that going as a national initiative over time and and you know really with a focus on high school coaches and with college coaches and youth coaches who uh, who who drink the Kool Aid in this area that really want you know that have the time to really look more into the social emotional. Um, development of, of themselves and of their of their athletes, and so that's been just been really exciting. Kind of uh, linking up with different different colleges, have, we'll be going up to New England to do a uh, master class, starting our master class with Endicott College coaches in oh, uh, you know Boston, and then uh, continuing to work with uh, public high schools and independent uh, high schools uh, 
just to 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 kind of kind of spread that word out there. So that's been that's really exciting. No, that's great. And so any coach who can get a you know a hands on get a hand get their hands on your book, but then get a, an extra personalized uh, class master class on it, you know, is going to set themselves up. That's great. Um, in, in a great way. So I really, I, I'm hoping, we're hoping to do some things together. So let's both keep our, mi- our, our eyes open and our minds open for that. Certainly will. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. And um, no, I just want to thank you for making the time today. Again, I want people to pick up a copy of The Coaching Zone. Um, I'm obviously Amazon's probably the easiest, but there's other ways to get it, but probably Amazon. Am I right? Sure. Yeah. 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 The Coaching Zone, yeah, Next Level Leadership in Sports is, is on Amazon. Yes. on Amazon and um, hopefully we'll do this again we'll kind of because I know there's so much more we can talk about mm-hmm. so many shared passions we have but thanks again for for joining us good thank you Mitch I appreciate okay it.